Good morning. I'm so blessed to be with you today and so blessed to hear that beautiful music. Thank you. That was amazing. So I want to begin this morning by telling you a little story about the first time I went snow skiing. I was nine years old and my parents had taken me to Mammoth Mountain in Northern California. I had never even seen snow. So they decided to enroll me in the children's beginning ski school class. Now mind you, at nine I was pretty tall and so there I am with like four and five year olds. But anyway, it was okay. And we had our own special section of what they called the bunny slope. Now, when you're nine and you have a fear of heights, bunny slope is a misnomer. It could have been a black diamond to me. And then we had our own special ski lift. Not the chair kind where you get to sit down. The T-bar that goes behind you and kind of drags you up the mountain. Well, for the life of me, I could not stay on that thing. I just kept falling off. I spent basically most of the day on my side next to the lift while the rest of my class went up the mountain and actually learned how to ski. I never even heard the words of instruction because I was always down at the bottom of the hill. And to make matters worse, my instructor didn't even know my name. He called me Jill the entire day. Where you get Jill from Kimberly, I don't know. But I was too miserable to try to correct him. And then, as the day was drawing to a close, the weather took a turn for the worse. I'm talking blizzard set in. So much so, it was record snowfall and they closed Mammoth Mountain for like the rest of the time we were there. And so there I was, right in the thick of the beginning. And wouldn't you know, I had finally made it up to the top of the lift, but I didn't know how to ski. And my instructor was nowhere in sight. My class, gone. So there I stood frozen to the spot, wondering, what do I do now? I've spent all day in ski school, and I haven't actually learned how to ski. Am I going to freeze to death on the side of the hill, a frozen snow girl forever erroneously known as Jill? <laughs> Did I panic? Did I cry? Did I scream? Yes. But the blizzard coming in masked all that. No one could see or hear me. And so I was, for all intents and purposes, alone. I'm sure you all can relate in one way or another. We've all had experiences where we've been left out or left behind or seemingly forgotten when we're stuck and we don't know how to move forward. Maybe there's some of us in that place right now. And so we can sympathize, to some extent anyway, with the Israelites in today's story of the golden calf found in Exodus 32. They were waiting on their leader too, not on the side of a mountain in a snowstorm, but on the, at the bottom of one in the desert. I'm sure they were hot and tired and irritable, and yet all they could do was wait for Moses to come back Wait to hear the next word from God. Wait to take the next step to the promised land. For those of you who are new here today, we're in the midst of a sermon series. We're following along with Moses and the Israelites. We've seen them be rescued from Egypt. We've seen God get them through the wilderness and to the foot of the mountain. And now he's preparing them for the final leg of their journey. And so when we left Moses last week, he was on top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And then the next part of the story gets a little confusing. There's a lot of going up the mountain and coming back down again and then going back up the mountain. And Mount Sinai is not small. I'm sure if Moses had a Fitbit, he would outdo us all with his steps. But in the 32nd chapter of Exodus, we find Moses back at the top of Mount Sinai. God had just given him the stone tablets with the law inscribed upon it and instructions 
for everything they would need to know for worship. We might say it was the first seminary class. And so as we pick up the story today, we read in Exodus 32.1, when the people saw that Moses delayed to calm down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. The people had concluded that Moses wasn't coming back either because of some fault of his own or because some tragedy had befallen him and they were scared after all their grumbling about Moses, now they don't know what to do without him. He was their go-between with God. And after witnessing the awesome display of thunder and lightning and hearing the warning to not even touch the mountain, lest they be killed, I think they realized how much they needed a go-between. They didn't wanna have to speak to God. So I think in their minds, they were all alone and maybe a little afraid to go in search of God themselves. So what did they do next? They went to Aaron and asked Aaron to make them little G gods to go before them. Remember Aaron? The charismatic, well-spoken brother of Moses, the one who had been by his side in the confrontation with Pharaoh the one who had even journeyed halfway up the mountain to see God for himself. What did Aaron do? He gave the people what they wanted. And in doing so, Aaron opened wide the door of sin. Not only did the people worship what used to be their jewelry and was melted together in the shape of a calf thanks to Aaron, they attributed to that inanimate thing their salvation from Egypt, and they reveled. They indulged, they lost their collective minds and drunk with sin, they forgot to whom they belonged and why. They broke the second commandment before Moses could even get down the mountain with it written on stone. It almost seems inconceivable, doesn't it? We wonder, how could they do this so easily? Here we see the grip of sin, the insidious way in which it ensnares and entangles us. Here we see the Garden of Eden all over again, the fallen nature of humankind on full display. And here, if I'm honest, I see myself sometimes I feel the truth of the Apostle Paul who said in Romans, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. Anyone else ever feel like that? How many mornings do I blow it before I even get out the front door because I'm tired and I haven't had my coffee yet? and my people who I love so much for the 1,000th time can't find their shoes, seem suddenly surprised that we have to go to school after all. And so we're rushing around, packing up backpacks, making lunch, and then someone says to me, Mom, I need blue poster board for my class today. <laughs> Baby, Amazon doesn't deliver that fast. <laughs> and instead of reacting with patience and grace, I make it worse by saying those two words, hurry up. Those words seem to have the exact opposite effect. Everyone gets stressed out and someone starts crying and then I start crying. We're all driving to school in utter misery and I find that I need to repent to God and it's not even 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> Please someone say amen. amen. <laughs> or how about when something really bad happens? when we get the phone call that changes everything, when our circumstances shift so violently that we can't seem to see or hear or feel God, and then fear and anxiety and doubt set in. 
life is hard. And maintaining faith in the midst of the hard and following a God who isn't always easy to see can seem almost impossible sometimes. So sometimes we find ourselves clinging too tightly to human leaders rather than to God. Sometimes instead of trusting this God who created the universe, we create false gods, little g-gods, who don't care what we do, who just want us to be happy, who don't ask too much of us. Sometimes we run away from God altogether and it takes hitting rock bottom to make us consider God again. The Apostle Paul tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we see the truth of those words in this story of the golden calf. But what we also see in this story, if we can get past the awful sin, is the mercy and grace of our glorious God. His amazing grace. This story of the golden calf that begins with the worst of mankind leads us to a better understanding of what it looks like to be the best of mankind, of what it looks like to truly be the people of God. Will you pray with me for a moment? Gracious God, I pray that we would receive the words you have for us today, that we would take your message to heart and grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, none of the insanity occurring at the foot of the mountain went unnoticed by God. He heard and saw everything. He already knew it was going to happen. So why did God give the people so much time and space to mess it all up? Why not just give Moses the tablets and the instructions for worship the first time he went up the mountain? And then they could have quickly gone on their way. Because God needed to prepare the people for the promised land, in order to grow and mature, in order to own their faith for themselves and put their trust in God rather than just in Moses, God knew the Israelites needed to be tested. God wanted to lay bare the state of their hearts and the state of Moses' heart as well. Each of these people in this story needed to be confronted with their own reality. And that can be a scary thing. But it's a good thing too. If we're open to God, if we're humble, that's the place where transformation really begins. And so God says to Moses, your stiff-necked people have really done it this time. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Destruction was the very punishment that God decreed would happen if the Israelites disobeyed. It is the punishment that sin deserves. Paul wrote in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Yet, God did not immediately act. God could have just zapped the people right then and said, Moses, I am starting over with you. God didn't need Moses to step aside. But in giving Moses the choice to step aside, God gave him the opportunity to intercede, to prove his faithfulness, to demonstrate his hunger and thirst for righteousness. God involved Moses in a discussion that revealed the genuine nature of their relationship. There was a real give and take going on. Just as there is with us, the key is not to pray for our will, but for God's. The key is not to have in mind the things of this world, but the things of God's kingdom. And Moses, he seemed to know this because he implored God to turn from his anger, relent, not bring disaster upon the people for the sake of God's own name. Moses didn't want the Egyptians to defame God's character by saying, oh, that Israelite God, he only rescued the people so that he could wipe them out in the Sinai desert. Moses knew God had promised to make descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as numerous as the stars. And Moses knew God would be 
faithful to that promise. Here we see the exact opposite of Aaron. Moses didn't enable the sin of the people. He didn't justify it. He didn't agree with it. When offered the opportunity, he didn't even think twice about his own gain. He risked his life for the sake of a stubborn, stiff-necked people. Why? Because Moses loved God, and Moses loved God's people. Doesn't Jesus call us to do the very same? Moses knew that great leadership is not always about giving people what they want. Loving people well is not always about giving people what they want. Respecting people is not always about giving people what they want, but giving people what they need. And that, my friends, is God, and nothing and no one else will do. And what does scripture say that God does? Exodus 32, 14 says, then the Lord relented. And that Hebrew word for relent can be translated to sigh, breathe strongly, be sorry, even be comforted. It's the deep sigh of a God who loves his people, who loves us, who is merciful and gracious. It's important to understand that God doesn't relent because Moses intercedes, but because it is in God's character. Moses' intercession highlights that. It reveals God's goodness to the rest of us. And oh, how Moses points the way to the ultimate intercessor, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who actually did lay down his life for us. From the moment he was born into this fallen world and took on human flesh, to the moment on the cross when he willingly gave up his spirit and paid the wages of sin in full to that glorious moment when he rose again and offered us newness of life. I know sometimes we read these stories in the Old Testament and God seems scary and angry and intimidating. But if you can see past the pronouncement of what the people deserve to what God actually does, you will see that the words of James are true. Mercy triumphs over justice. In fact, we see that God's justice is mercy. And God's mercy is justice. Across every page of scripture, Old Testament are new. Our God is a God who loves us and wants our love in return. Our God is a God who pours himself out for us. God does not abandon us to our sin. Even when we mess up, it is God who reaches out first with restoration and redemption. God knew what we needed was God. And he knew we needed someone to help us find our way back to him. Someone to intercede for us when we were so lost in sin that we didn't even know we were lost. For the Israelites, that someone was Moses. For us, it is Jesus Christ. Now clearly, as you can see, I did not end up freezing to death on the side of that bunny slope. But my ski instructor really did leave me, and he never came back. But I was not alone. Unbeknownst to me, my best friend's mom had been keeping tabs on me all day. She knew it was my first time to ski and that my parents were in their own ski school class. And so she stuck around the bunny slope, just in case. And when she sensed the storm coming in, she followed me up that lift, just in case. And so before my tears could even freeze to my face, I heard her familiar voice, follow me, keep your eyes on me, follow my tracks, and I will get you down the mountain. My friends, Jesus comes in search of us, and he says something similar, follow me. Keep your eyes fixed on me. I'm not always going to give you what you want in this world. You will have trouble. 
but I'm giving you myself. And I have overcome the world. So take heart. Through faith in me, you are more than overcomers. And then Jesus calls us to go on our own rescue mission because God wants to use us to bring other people to the foot of his cross. Like Moses, God wants to use us to make his character known to a world that wants nothing to do with him. And when that world looks at us and sees love and kindness, And faith, despite the difficulty of life, it brings God glory. Just as Moses' intercession for a stiff-necked people brought God glory. I don't think it's a coincidence that God placed this sermon series on the heart of our senior pastor at this time. As we watch the events unfolding in our country and even in the greater church, I keep thinking of those words from the book of Esther. Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Church, I believe we are here for such a time as this. I know that what we see and hear around us can make us anxious. It can feel like we're at the foot of the mountain, alone in the desert, with no idea how to wade through the mess that surrounds us. But God will not let the church fall. He has promised us that it will stand the test of time when everything that man has made turns to dust. The kingdom of God will go on and on and on. So I want to encourage us, church, In the words of the author of Hebrews, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Moses didn't give up on the Israelites, and Jesus never gives up on us. So dear church, let's be intercessors in this broken world. What would it look like if we agreed to boldly pray together for the church, for our country, for the world? I know this is a praying church. I know you are faithful intercessors. So what if we all agree to do the simplest thing, to just pray the Lord's Prayer? They do it on KSBJ. Pray it at noon every single day until the end of this sermon series. And what if we do it asking God to pour out his mercy on this broken and still beautiful world? The story of the golden calf shows us the importance of intentional intercession. So wherever we are, whether alone or in the crowd, at work, at home, at school, driving, Let's pray with intention and in unison. Because if our society and our culture refuses to turn to God, they can't even recognize how much they need God, then it is our blessing to pray on their behalf. Because we love God and we love God's people. We can shine in this dark world like stars in the sky as we hold firmly to the word of life and offer that word as a beacon of hope to those who have forgotten whose they are and why. I believe in the days to come, we will see a revival spring forth from those within the church who continue to stand firm on the foundation of Jesus who continue to stand firm on the truth of the gospel and who continue to draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit to be holy. I believe revival can start right here and right now as we remember the lesson of Moses and offer people not what they want but who they need. Let's give the world Jesus. Let's be his hands and feet and voices lighting up the darkness and pointing the way to the promised land, to that eternal kingdom of God where all are welcome through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.